Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming live on the iHeart and iTunes app. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So hi there, my name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you are listening. Today, on the Jewish calendar, is the beginning of the month of Elul. Can you imagine? This is the last month in the Jewish year, and one month will be the uh, beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. To prepare us for that, we have the custom of blowing the shofar every single day to wake us up and to remind us of this great, great New Year coming to us. So allow me now to blow the shofar as we prepare, we too prepare here on Long Island. was the sound of the shofar that was not some emergency uh, button going off over there so here's the month wishing everybody a good month of Elul now this month of Elul is a very special one Elul it's spelled E-L-U-L is the last month of the Jewish year it's kind of a paradoxical time you might want to call this uh, spiritual work days you see The Jewish calendar distinguishes itself between two kinds of qualities of time. We have the mundane time and the holy time, Chol and Kodesh. So ordinary work days are typically called mundane portions of time. The Sabbath, the festivals, are examples of holy time. On holy days, we disengage ourselves from the material involvement of the world, and of course we devote ourselves to the spiritual pursuits of study and prayer, which is typically what we do on the Sabbath, the holidays. Then there are also days enriched by very special spiritual resources. The rest on the Sabbath, the freedom on Passover, the awe of Rosh Hashanah. So each of these days, these holy days, provide us with a unique quality as we journey through the calendar of our lives. When we talk about this month, the Jewish month that we're beginning today, the month of Elul, resembles a holy portion in the calendar. Why? Because Elul is a haven, so to speak. It's a city of refuge. We step back from the ravages of material life. We start to do a little auditing of ourselves, of our, our accounting of our lives. And we look back to assess the year gone by. We're all preparing now for the days of war. Or are we preparing in the synagogue, looking forward to welcoming everyone as we prepare for the new year? For Rosh Hashanah, we look forward to going to Yom Kippur, and there's Sukkot and everything else that goes with it. It's a time when, during this month, we increase in our Torah study, our prayers, our charitable activities. So here comes the month of Elul, an opportune time for all of this, because it's a month where God relates to all of us in a very more open and compassionate way. And this is the time when we have to take advantage of this. But at the same time, it's unlike the uh, Sabbath and the holidays. These days, these this coming four weeks, are work, work days mostly. So, on the one hand, it's a, it's a regular weekdays. On the other hand, though, it's such special times of introspection. It's interesting, it's both. So, in the transcending activities of El. We're kind of conducting them in the workday lives of our, life, of our work. We go to work. There's no extra holidays here. So I want to share with you how the first Chabad Rebbe of Liadi, Rabbi Shneer Zam of Liadi, explains the paradoxical feelings of the month of El with the following metaphor. He gives the example of the king in the field. The king's usual place is in the capital city, in the royal palace. Anyone wishing to approach the king has to go through the appropriate channels. 
you know, the palace bureaucracy and gain the approval of the secretaries and ministers if you want to see the king in the palace. You've got a journey through the, to the capital, pass through the many gates and the corridors that leads to the throne room. Of course, when you finally get to the king, you have to be meticulously prepared and you have to adhere to an exact code of dress, speech, mannerism when you speak to the king. However, there are times when the king comes out to the fields, outside in the city. Such times, right? The king comes into the city, into the, into the fields, has left his palace, and it will go over to him. The king receives them with a smiling face, a radiant countenance. And this anyone can, right, who's like out there in the field, plowing the field, doing his weekday activities, suddenly has access to the king, which is unavailable even to the highest ranking minister when he's in the palace. This is how we must feel going into this month of Elul in the last four weeks before the new year. The king is in the field. In the month of this month, the king comes to the field. He leaves his palace. The Almighty God leaves the typical environment and comes to the life, visits us where we are. What happens when the farmer sees the king in the field? Does he keep on plowing? Does he behave as if he's just another day? Of course not. So Elo is not just a month of ordinary weekdays like we've had until now. So we increase in our Torah study, more fervently our prayers. We become more generous, more kind. Suddenly the air ch- is charged with holiness. We can still be in the field, dressed like a regular workday, but suddenly our field becomes a holier place. So, um, on the, uh, uh, as well, when the farmer sees the king in the field, does he run home to wash and change? Does he rush to the capital to, to you know, practice protocol? The king is in the field to come and talk to us. That's how close and how careful and the, the opportune moment we have. See, in the month of Elul, the essence and the objective of life becomes that much more accessible. No longer do the material trappings of life kind of conceal and distort our purpose, because the king has emerged from the concealment of the palace. He's with us in our workday, and within our material environment, in our working man's terms, we're able to access. So, most importantly, dear friends, let's make good use of this time when we encounter the king, so to speak, and ask for a good and sweet new year. Allow me to continue now on a very important, interesting subject. Why the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, chose the teachings of Frankel over Sigmund Freud. In, in Vienna of 1960, in Vienna, Viktor Frankl, the world-famous author and psychologist, was really ready to up root his whole life in research, clinical practice, and he was going to move to Australia from Vienna. He survived the imaginable, unimaginable horrors of the Holocaust. He emerged from the ashes of Auschwitz with an orthodox and daring theory, as we all know, of human psychology. He could no longer endure the constant derision of his life's work by his colleagues in the same field. You see, Frank Frankel's view of human nature differed in certain key areas from the party line Freudian views that dominated the discipline of psychology after the war, making him and his work consistently a target of public scholarly ridicule. It was this very uh, diminution of his deepest held beliefs that he felt this is his last straw. He could no longer, he could s- survive the attacks of the Nazis on his body, but he couldn't, couldn't bear any more the attacks of his peers on his soul, so to speak. It was at that moment when Marguerite Chayes, a well-known opera singer and descendant of Vishnus and Hasidim, knocked on his door in Vienna. When Dr. Frankel came to the door, he found a sharply dressed woman whom he had never met before standing on his doorsteps. She announced herself as the bearer of a personal message addressed to him by the Hasidic Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson from Brooklyn, New York. Upon hearing this startling explanation for her visit and recognizing the name of the Rebbe, Dr. Frankel promptly invited this lady inside to speak privately. What does she say? The Rebbe asked me to tell you that you must not give up. You must be strong. 
Do not be disturbed by those who ridicule you. You will succeed and your work will achieve a major breakthrough. Upon hearing this reassuring voice from afar, Dr. Frankel broke into tears. Dispirited, he had recently been filling out his immigration papers to move to Australia. He had given up. But the Rebbe's words of encouragement brought Dr. Frankel back to life. After regaining his composure, Dr. Frankel responded vigorously and with a renewed commitment to continue his life's work. And indeed he did. Following this fateful meeting, Dr. Frankel redoubled his efforts in spreading his unique insights and therapeutic approaches to healing of the human psychic. Not long afterwards, his famous book called Man's Search for Meaning was translated into English, sparking immediate popular interest in his work and worldview that has continued to this very day. That work alone has been translated into 28 languages and sold over 10 million copies giving birth to an entire genre of self-help literature as well as the field of uh, logoth- logotherapy. I hope I'm saying that right. Frankl's unique philosophy and practice of psychology, health, and healing. History tells us that Viktor Frankl went on to become one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. He lived through the hell of the Holocaust, nevertheless found the strength to put forth an inspiring view of the human psychic that diverge in fundamental ways from the accepted norms of his time. But why was the Rebbe so concerned with Dr. Frankel, and particularly with the fate of his work? There were plenty of Jewish psychologists at the time. Freud himself was Jewish. What was it about doctors, Dr. Frankel's view of human psyche that so piqued the Rebbe's interest and attracted his attention, his personal attention and his support? The answer that, to answer that question... We got to dig deeper into the beginnings of psychoanalysis itself. In the 1920s, Viktor Frankl was a prize student of Sigmund Freud. Indeed, from the very inception of the field of psychoanalysis, Frankl was an early adopter and gifted. Uh, he really w- fell into the uh, thinking of Freud's radical theories and practices. However, over time, their ideas about the shape and the substance of human consciousness and nature began to diverge. Where Freud, where Freud saw the cornerstone of the human consciousness as a purely self-serving pleasurable, pleasurable kind of principle, Frankl saw the soul's potential, the ability to transcend the limitations of self through a search for meaning and deeds of loving kindness. This fundamental rift between their perspectives only grew wider and pronounced over the years. Sigmund Freud having passed away in 1939, was never forced to face the ultimate inhumanity of the Holocaust. One can only imagine how that might have complicated or clarified his initial insights into the psychic nature of a human being. Viktor Frankl, on the other hand, survived Auschwitz. He heard its terrible sounds and saw its dark visions. He tasted its putrid waters and smelled its rotting corpses. But he also witnessed miraculous deeds of utter selflessness and caring. If Freud were in the concentration camps, Frankl wrote, he would have changed his position. Beyond the basic natural drives and instincts of people, he would have encountered the the human capacity of self-transcendence. We who lived in the concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. There may have been a few in number, but they offer sufficient proof, says Frankl, that everything can be taken from a man but one thing. The last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. It was thus within the crucible of this horrific concentration camp that Frankl came to refine and crystallize his earlier intuitions concerning the underlying realities of human psychology. Once the war was over, Dr. Frankl could not avoid the inevitable collision with his former teacher. So the root of their conflict cuts right to the heart and what constitutes the core of a person. In their own way, they each sought to uncover what is underneath it all, what lies hidden within the psychic depths beneath beneath the masks that we show the world. They both wanted to know what truly drives a human being. Who are they really? So in response to these questions, both Freud and Frankl, they 
presented, they posited their views, meaning that each human contains multiple levels of awareness, including, of course, the unconscious regions of the psychic that influence the person on their behavior that uh, expresses itself through, through dreams and language, as we all know. The difference between their views lies in their respective diagnosis of what ultimately is the root of our personality. We often joke that Sigmund Freud found the id, and Viktor Frankl went a little deeper and found the yid. So Freud taught that our core of a human being is called the id, which is completely unconscious, impulsive portion of, our, of this pleasure principle, which is the source of basic appetites and drives, for instant pleasure and gratification. Dr. Frankl said, no, that's not the key. That's not the root of every person. He felt that Freud and his colleagues reduced a human being to some mechanical creature, depriving him of some true essence. He believed and th that if you look do deep, deep down into the person, therefore his, the title of his best-selling book is Man's Search for Meaning. That's the fundamental difference between Freud and Frankl. Concerning what lies at the root of a human psychic, is beautifully encapsulated in a conversation between the Rebbe and a well-known professor who complained to the Rebbe about the twisted nature of people. From my encounters in life, he said, I have noticed that people might seem nice and charming. They may express concern for you, show interest in your life, and even openly admit they love you. But if one digs a little deeper than the outer surface, at their core, they're selfish, they're arrogant, egotistical, why is this the nature of mankind? And the Rebbe responded, When one walks in the street, things often look so elegant and appealing. Tall flowery trees, fancy houses, paved roads, expensive cars. If one takes a shovel and begins to dig beneath the surface, Gavalt, he discovers dirt and mud, nothing like the beautiful but deceptive world above the ground. At this point, the professor was, was nodding in agreement. But if he weren't to give up, the Rebbe concluded, and would continue to dig deeper, he would eventually encounter precious minerals and diamonds. So the Rebbe acknowledged that the fact that beneath the surface of people's outward personalities, there often lies some less than fat, uh, flattering psychic reality. But the Rebbe stressed that if you went a little bit deeper, but beyond the dirt and the mud, you could find something holy. And that, of course, is the soul. And that's the, exactly why the Rebbe took such a strong interest in Dr. Frankel and his work. Because Dr. Frankel's view of human psychic corresponds quite closely to that of the Hasidic understanding, that we all have a soul beneath the surface of, of ourself. This soul forms the very core of our being and connects us to the other souls and to the higher power. Activation of this core point within is what allows us to transcend our basic nature and become a force for good in this world. So my friends, we've shared a lot today and it is clear above all and ultimately despite Freud's uncontested influence in the secular psychology the Rebbe felt a kinship towards Dr. Frankel's ideas and his approach to healing and motivation to human being to become more human so the Rebbe agreed with Dr. Frankel that each person has the potential to be much more than just their body and their ego and by activating their inner point of ultimate meaning a person can escape the quicksand of self-centeredness and truly become holy. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing you all the best. Thank you, and have a great week.